This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. New Mexico, a few miles outside Albuquerque. The landscape gives way to a dusty sprawl dotted by strip malls and subdivisions. On April 16, 1981, Sandoval County Sheriff Gennaro Ferrara was dispatched to a remote patch of desert 20 miles north of the city. Among the rocks and sand, two gas company workers had discovered a body. It was a very gruesome sight. It was totally uh, nude. There were no clothes on. The body had been burned off. And you could see where some predators, maybe coyotes, had tried to gnaw at the body. It was clearly a homicide. The body had been burned, the skull fractured. The crime scene yielded no clues about who killed this person. But a medic alert bracelet was found nearby, and it was quickly traced to a woman named Pamela Sue Barker. Tattoos on the corpse suggested she could be a biker. The sheriff tracked down the dead woman's mother, who confirmed that her daughter was indeed a biker. This image is one of the only available pictures of Pamela Barker. The mother revealed her daughter had been married to a man named Sonny Pearson. The mom says Pearson. We start looking. Police started canvassing local biker hangouts. They soon learned that Sonny Pearson and his wife were mysterious recent additions to this part of New Mexico. Two years earlier, the couple had moved to a subdivision outside Albuquerque called Rio Rancho. Pearson invested in a trucking business and in this truck stop, the Big Chief Cafe. Alice Vick and her son Daniel were both working there when Pearson became part owner. He was a biker and hung around with the biker crowd and you don't really, you don't ask a lot of questions in that, that circle of people. I was prep cook and he just always back there visiting with me, I guess because of my age. <laughs> And, like, you know, he calls me mom. And we just got to be real friendly. Tried to turn him on to God, but it didn't work. The 31-year-old Pearson was a distinctive figure, even among local bikers, standing five foot seven, with a long beard, a limp, and a glass eye from a childhood accident. When he didn't have any money and he was in a bar, he'd take his eye out and drop it in somebody's drink when they weren't looking, and then they wouldn't want their drink anymore, he'd take it. <laughs> Sonny could talk people into almost anything. I mean, he just had that personality and he had that gift. He made me real uneasy. Businesswoman Judy Crawley knew Pearson and his wife Michelle from his trucking business. She was busy working on the motorcycles and Sonny was busy being the tough guy. I didn't see a lot of closeness with Michelle and Sonny. They were more like friends. Now, following the discovery of the corpse in the desert, and two days after police got Pearson's name, Sonny himself paid Sheriff Ferrara a visit. He said he had heard about the body and was sure it was his wife. He said, I want to see my wife, I want to see my wife, and I said, you know, sit down, we need to ask you a few questions. Pearson told police his wife had disappeared six weeks earlier from their trailer home. He had filed a missing persons report in neighboring Bernalillo County. Pearson had filed a report on March the 2nd, stating that his wife and him had gotten into an argument. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, she took off and walk, was walking. Last time he seen her, he says, he was heading south on the tracks behind the trailer court. And it just didn't fit. Where was this woman gonna go at 2 a.m.? The sheriff grilled Sonny for more than three hours, during which Pearson revealed that he had a criminal past and a secret identity, courtesy of the federal government. He gives me the story about the, uh, the Marshal Service Witness Protection Program. Come to pass, he did say at one point in time that he had robbed the bank at one point in his life. Pearson refused to say much else, but did mention that he'd served time at the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. He dared the sheriff to contact the U.S. Marshal Service for more answers. 
Ferrara left Pearson in the interrogation room and went to call the Marshal Service in Albuquerque. I says, listen, yeah, we know this guy. I says, you need to give me some information on what all. He says, well, we can't give out any information about his prior and this and that, but we have some other information. The Marshal confirmed that his suspect and his wife had both received new identities as Michelle and Charles Sonny Pearson. Pearson's real name was Marion Albert Pruitt. The Marshal divulged one other startling detail. Apparently, the night before she disappeared, Pruitt's wife called a Marshal at home and said she was afraid her husband was going to kill her. The Marshal told her to contact local police in the morning. That was the last anyone heard from her. Once Sheriff Ferrara was done talking to the marshal in Albuquerque, he returned to the interrogation room and confronted his suspect. I told him, you murdered your wife. You did it. You're going to be put downstairs. I'm locking you up as a material witness. I know I could hold him for 72 hours, and then kept trying to develop more stuff. But the sheriff's case quickly fell apart. 48 hours later, a judge ordered the suspect released for lack of evidence. Then the FBI sent back a report on the man's fingerprints. They sent me back a print card that said no record. I was sort of taken back. No record. This guy's telling me he had been in the Atlanta penitentiary. No record. Couldn't get any, anything. Nothing. With no help from either the FBI or the U.S. Marshals, Sheriff Ferrara and his deputies kept on trying to crack the case. Almost two months later, finally, a breakthrough. Police tracked down a close friend of Marion Pruitt's who seemed nervous about talking. After some prodding, 24-year-old Bill Sherman confessed that he saw Pruitt kill his wife and that he helped dispose of the body. He tells me I was there. I was there when he murdered her. And you know what? He was eager to get that off his chest. There was no question that Bill Sherman was terrified of, of Marion Pruitt uh, and that uh, Marion Pruitt uh, used his persona to totally control and manipulate the accomplice in this case. Sherman began telling the sheriff about the night Pruitt's wife disappeared. He said he spent the evening drinking with Pruitt at his trailer. Then he claimed his friend told him to go home and return later that night so they could discuss his trucking business. Sherman returned and said Pruitt immediately took a hammer into the bedroom where his wife was asleep. There were screams. Then Sherman entered the room. Blood was all over. She was just fairly not even moving at that point in time. And then what they did is they, they took the body and put it in the trunk of a car and took it out to the Mesa, which is on the west side of Albuquerque here, and then burned it and left it. Based on this eyewitness account, authorities issued an arrest warrant for Marion Pruitt. But Pruitt had disappeared. Investigators later found out that before he left town, he had stopped by to see his employee and friend, Alice Vick. He just told me he had to leave because they were, the law was blaming him for the murder of his wife. And he told me, he said, I swear to you on my mom's soul that I did not kill my wife. And those were his words when he left. Marion Pruitt escaped New Mexico undetected and went on a nationwide crime spree. And because the Federal Witness Protection Program had given Pruitt a new cleaned-up identity, the government would be widely blamed for allowing the rampage to occur. The guy that turns a wild animal loose to kill is responsible. It's not the wild animal. The wild animal is just doing what comes naturally. In June 1981, police in Sandoval County, New Mexico, just outside Albuquerque, issued an all-points bulletin for Marion Albert Pruitt. 
As a member of the Witness Protection Program, the man had been living under the name Sonny Pearson. He was now wanted for the murder of his wife. Pruitt would elude capture for months, go on a killing spree, and in the process live up to a nickname he had carried with him since his teens, Mad Dog. What caused him to become this way, uh, how he became that way, I don't know. I think he's a person who just liked to hurt, and hurt in the most severe way. Pruitt's case would throw a harsh spotlight on the Federal Witness Protection Program and raise the question, does society sometimes pay too high a price for the secret deals the government makes with violent criminals? Marion Albert Pruitt was raised in Charlotte, North Carolina. His childhood pursuits of baseball and roller skating gave way in his teens to a motorcycle gang and drugs. He took speed, smoked pot, and drank so much of the inexpensive brand of wine, Mogan David, that his friends started calling him by its street name, Mad Dog. Crime came easily to him, as did prison time. A six-month sentence for petty theft at age 17 cemented a lifelong hatred of authority. He took to robbing banks, which earned him at age 21 a long stretch in the Atlanta penitentiary. Eight years later, in the spring of 1978, one year before Pruitt's scheduled release, his cellmate and informant in a drug trial was murdered. The 28-year-old Pruitt claimed he witnessed the crime and offered to testify if he could win a spot in the Federal Witness Protection Program. It fell to Gerald Shore at the U.S. Justice Department to consider the request. I would have to be convinced that that witness was very important to what I concluded was a very important case. Here an informant had been murdered, that would be a very important case. So Marion Pruitt was placed in witness protection. He was paroled in November 1979, 11 months early, based on his cooperation with the government. He then married Pamela Sue Barker, whom he'd met while in prison. The U.S. Marshals moved the newlyweds to New Mexico and gave them new identities as Charles and Michelle Pearson. For about nine months, the couple received a monthly stipend of $800 until they were deemed self-sufficient. Pruitt bought into two businesses and made friends. He said he was happy with his life. He wasn't trouble, drank a lot, and I'd be chewing him out, telling him to eat instead of drink. <laughs> and he, that's when he started calling me mama. He'd say, yes, mama, yes, mama. But we never had any trouble with him. Always treated me great. But Pruitt eventually did get into trouble. In August 1980, he was charged with disorderly conduct and resisting arrest after a barroom brawl. However, Pruitt had no arrest record under his new identity, Charles Pearson. The judge had no idea what kind of person he was dealing with. So instead of a return trip to prison for breaking parole, Pruitt received six months unsupervised probation. Just a few months later, Pruitt's wife would turn up dead. Pruitt became the prime suspect, but New Mexico authorities still could not get access to his real record. They weren't allowed to hold him in jail, and then the man disappeared. To be honest with you, I never got a copy of his rap sheet from the FBI. They weren't releasing anything. Now, wanted for the murder of his wife, Pruitt went on the run. On September 17th, 1981, a man dressed in a three-piece suit and a wig walked into the Unifirst Savings and Loan in Jackson, Mississippi. He told the tellers he was armed. This individual then handed one of the uh, bank employees a bag and asked her to fill it with money. He was told that they did not have that kind of money, to which he said, give me what you have. The suspect fled with about $7,000 in cash and a hostage, a 43-year-old bank loan officer named Peggy Lowe. Someone else was going to be the hostage, and that lady panicked, and uh, uh, Peggy more or less volunteered to be the hostage to get the other employees out of harm's way. My husband told me that there had been a bank robbery and that they had 
abducted my mother. They didn't know where she was at the moment, but I needed to go to the bank, to the universe, and my dad was there. The bank employees were there, the FBI, Jackson, police, TV reporters, everybody was there. Police scoured the area and found Peggy Lowe's car parked behind the bank. Hoping to find her inside, they told her husband to open the trunk. It was empty. Within hours, a statewide manhunt was underway. Authorities circulated Lowe's photograph. Helicopters buzzed over state highways. The bank robber and his hostage were nowhere to be found. The FBI distributed a composite sketch of the suspect, drawn from eyewitness accounts to field offices across the country. He, from physical statue, was a short person, I believe about five foot six, five foot seven, wearing sunglasses, and he walked with a limp. Calls came flooding into Mississippi from Corpus Christi, Texas, Tallahassee, Florida, and as far away as Seattle, Washington. Each jurisdiction reported that it too had a recent bank robbery with a suspect matching that very description. Fingerprint evidence soon confirmed it. Marion Mad Dog Pruitt had hit all the locations. This was little solace to the family of the still missing Peggy Lowe. Life at home was waiting for the phone to ring, waiting for somebody to tell us anything. Well, I was thinking, you know, maybe there's hope, but really after the second week, I, I knew within my heart that I'd never see her alive on this earth again. And he wasn't done yet. In Fort Smith, Arkansas, on October 12, 1981, a gunman walked into a convenience store and abducted the night shift clerk, Bobby Jean Robertson. Her body was discovered shot to death in a nearby wooded area. The suspect had escaped with $163 in cash. Four days later, and 850 miles away, a police investigator in Loveland, Colorado was dispatched to an early morning shooting at a 7-Eleven. Our victim was alive at that particular point in time. We don't know for sure how long he was on the floor of the store bleeding. Anthony Tate, the 21-year-old clerk, had been shot four times at point-blank range. The young man was pronounced dead at the hospital 45 minutes later. Police soon learned that 13 miles away in Fort Collins, Colorado, another 7-Eleven had also been robbed, and the overnight clerk, 24-year-old James Balderson, murdered. His parents found out later that morning. We always had some reservations with him working at night, but uh, Fort Collins, we thought, was as good a town as any. My first reaction was I just broke down and cried like a baby. I love my son. The Colorado police sent out an APB and got an immediate response from the FBI. The Bureau was keeping an eye out for suspicious robberies and sent back information on Marion Pruitt's bank robbery and kidnapping in Mississippi. Well, actually, you know, I thought the FBI was just throwing us a bone when we got the original teletype. I thought, how could this have any connection? You know, it doesn't... And Mississippi's a long way from Colorado, and I just didn't see any connection at all. Just two days later, the connection would be confirmed. On a highway outside Amarillo, Texas, state troopers pulled over a speeding Cadillac. A 38 caliber handgun was found under the seat, along with drug paraphernalia and 7-Eleven receipts from Colorado. The driver was arrested. His name was Marion Albert Pruitt. His five-month spree of seven holdups, which had left three people dead and one missing, was over. The arrest of Mad Dog Pruitt made headlines nationwide. The victims' families were furious when they found out the former bank robber had been given a new identity in the Federal Witness Protection Program. I did not have a feeling of anger until I found out his real name was Marion Albert Pruitt and found out that he was a protected witness. Then the rage started to build. If he was never in the witness program, he still would have committed crime. When I learned of Pruitt's crimes, I was personally devastated by the uh, 
deaths of every individual, who were young people and others, that he had killed were just wanton, reckless killing. The New Mexico sheriff who was pursuing Pruitt for killing his wife believed the crime spree never had to happen. Gennaro Ferrar. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. Insisted the FBI and the U.S. Marshals failed to give him assistance when it mattered. They're supposed to send us the information, especially when we got him arrested and on the card it says material witness homicide. Don't you think that they should have shared a little bit with us? They turned this mad dog out on society. Pruitt was first extradited to Jackson, Mississippi to face charges on armed bank robbery and the kidnapping of Peggy Lowe. Authorities chose Mississippi because Lowe was still missing. Two weeks later, Pruitt confessed to police that he had killed her and agreed on October 28, 1981, to take them to the body. As they drove to a wooded area near the Mississippi-Alabama border, Pruitt recounted the last two hours of Peggy Lowe's life. He said that after robbing the Unifirst Bank in downtown Jackson, he'd driven 125 miles east over the border into Alabama. He found an abandoned dirt road, then he stopped the car. He took Mrs. Lowe out of the car, took her into a, a wooded area, and had her take her clothes off for the purpose of leaving her. And he was thinking that, uh, you know, perhaps this is not good. He confronts her at this time, makes her go back, kneel down, and then ultimately he shoots her in the back of the head. One thing that I asked him, did he uh, sexually molest uh, Miss Lowe? And he said he did not. Uh, I asked him, she died instantly. And uh, he said that uh, he believed that she did. The agents followed Pruitt's directions to a clearing where they found Peggy Lowe's decomposing body. Then Pruitt abruptly announced that he was ready to leave and eat breakfast. The authorities were appalled. He had showed us, admitted to us that he killed this lady, and now I want something to eat. That's when the, that's when the old good American red-blooded Law enforcement man's blood gets real high. <laughs> you know, it, it, that, that's when you want to take the law into your own hands, but you know you can't. That same day after Marion Pruitt was driven back to Jackson, Mississippi, he granted an interview to four local reporters. From the start, he was remarkably candid about his crimes. No, I've become a mad dog killer. I've done so much cocaine. And I don't mind telling you, I killed two people in Colorado and one in Arkansas, too. That's how about a $4,000 a week cocaine habit, okay? It was a stunning free trial confession. Pruitt explained why he had become a killer. He blamed it on drugs. Because Peggy Long's death was uh, something that, uh, it was just... I was too high, it was accidental, and it was something that shouldn't have happened. You were high okay. on cocaine? Yeah, I was. That and methadrine with ether base and crank. Were you lying? Crank. You think so? Okay, you said you were trying to embarrass the federal government. In what way? Pruitt said he had harbored a grudge against the government since his first stint in prison as a teenager. Now Pruitt added one more reason to be angry. He believed that the sheriff in New Mexico had told the press about his protected witness status. And they let them tell everybody there that I was uh, a government witness and so was, was my wife. In reality, that information was only released after Pruitt fled. Pruitt used his bitterness as an excuse. I started out just to rob banks and embarrass the government, I mean, and there was a killing involved. Then I, I got a little bit more crazier. He was so resentful that he was unwilling to give the government credit for capturing him. The police in uh, Texas did not apprehend me. I let them catch me. I guess, I mean, surely you're aware of that. 
I mean, uh, me with a third, if I've killed five people and I got a 38 under the seat, what the hell am I doing going through town 69 miles an hour and not pulling a gun on them? It was a bizarre performance from a man who hadn't faced trial on any of his most recent crimes, the worst of which were murder charges for the killing of five people, including his wife. At the end of October 1981, captured spree killer Marion Mad Dog Pruitt held a two-day press conference in Jackson, Mississippi. He was facing charges for killing his wife, as well as four other murders. Even so, he discussed his life in the witness protection program and his nationwide crime spree. How did you do it? I was a solo artist. I, well, I... His statements also offered a glimpse into the workings of a criminal mind. He explained why he targeted savings and loans. 99% of the savings and loans are run by female and female managers. And women have not equal right things of getting into, but women has more common sense than a man does when it comes to bodily harm, okay? Where a man would try to play gun hold. The FBI says, don't play hero. How much money would you say that, that you uh, came across in, in these robberies all together? Is there any way or did you spend it uh, quickly? Yeah, I spent it very quickly. Too fast. On what? Good living, I guess they call it. Was it a good living? Lonely, I guess, you know. Not as far as people around me and stuff, just lonely feelings, you know. And it's like, what's that song they sung about the clown, but deep down inside, you know, he's a loser. Pruitt addressed questions about his upcoming trials and what penalty he thought he should receive for murdering 43 Jackson area resident Peggy Lowe. I think the people of Mississippi want to see me dead just as much as I want to die. Nothing, nothing justified the killing of, uh, of Peggy Lee or whatever her name was. If, it, if, if I think it was probable justification for myself, I wouldn't be asking for the death penalty. I killed an innocent person, it's that simple, okay? Do you think that you will gain anything by talking to the four of us? Uh, or do you hope to gain anything by talking to the four of us? I hope I, I can gain the support of the people that will turn around and help me. You know, maybe uh, this kind of sounds crazy, me asking the people of Mississippi to help me, but I'd like for them to help me, you know, for the state to have me to put me to death. I hope. In other words, you didn't want to stay in prison the rest of your life? That's my question. No, I, no I, I don't think so, because uh, right now society and everything is, uh, as far as uh, getting so weak about violence and, uh, and uh, clearing the criminal's mind and everything, they might have probed me in 10 years. I wouldn't have been but 42 then. I'd have still been ready to go raise hell again, wouldn't I? Pruitt might have saved the people of Mississippi the expense of a trial, but despite his bluster, he pleaded not guilty and left his fate to a jury. Pruitt requested to act as his own attorney. The judge agreed, but appointed lawyer William Kirksey as one of his advisors. Kirksey didn't think much of his client, but he also didn't think Pruitt was the only one to blame. Part of Marion Albert Pruitt's crimes should be laid right on the lap of the United States government. They protected him. The people of Mississippi did not, the people of New Mexico did not, or these other states. Marion Pruitt's trial for the murder of Peggy Lowe began in April 1982 in Columbus, Mississippi. If there were any doubts about the outcome, Pruitt quelled them by insisting on taking the stand. There was some electricity in the air, there's no question about it in the courtroom. Pruitt recounted robbing the Universe Savings and Loan and how he took Peggy Lowe to the woods in Alabama and murdered her. 
I guess the worst part of it was his description of it and and what he was doing and all he was thinking about was getting his fix and all and it was it was just so hard to restrain myself. Pruitt displayed needle marks on his arms to the jury. His defense, he said, was that the drugs made him kill. He refused to take blame for his true inner self, and his true inner self was a murdering scumbag. And I hate that my mother had her last thoughts were with him and had to look at him. The jury only took three hours to determine that Pruitt was guilty and deserved the death penalty. The judge agreed. I will never forget when Judge Coleman read him the sentencing order of the court saying that he would be put to death on so-and-so date at Partsman Prison. This mean, tough guy, who I say is a punk, his knees buckled and he almost went to the floor. I will never forget that. Marion Pruitt racked up another death sentence in Arkansas for the murder of convenience store clerk Bobby Jean Robertson. In Colorado, in exchange for two life sentences, Pruitt pleaded guilty to killing the two other clerks, Anthony Tate and James Balderson. This plea bargain satisfied Balderson's father. I figured Pruitt would never see the light of day again, uh, which is fine with me. Then in February 1983, Pruitt appeared in a New Mexico court to stand trial for the one crime he maintained he did not commit, the murder of his wife, Pamela Sue Barker. He was tried under the name he received in the witness protection program, Charles Sonny Pearson. During pretrial motions, the defendant criticized Judge Thomas Meskel for refusing to grant a change of venue. I have a couple other requests I'd like to make. One is I want a gag order on the, if a uh, gag order on the case, I'd like the news media removed out of this courtroom. I believe this is nothing but a political trial for uh, certain people to use as stepping stones for their political future <coughs> on me, okay? Pruitt was a very hostile individual, but he was also a person who liked and I believe craved attention. He just didn't want to have a silent part. He wanted to have a speaking part uh, in, in those shows. He gave statements which I'm sure a defense attorney would be aghast at him doing. The result in this case was the same as in all of his other trials. The jury convicted Marion Albert Pruitt, a.k.a. Charles Sonny Pearson, of first-degree murder. He received a third life sentence on top of his two death sentences. When you looked into his eyes, uh, it, you just, you could see right through him. It's kind of analogous to sharks. When you look into their eyes, you just, you see ice. Marion Pruitt, the self-proclaimed Mad Dog Killer. By 1999, he had been on death row for 17 years. Just two weeks before his execution in Arkansas, the 49-year-old gave one last interview. A Swedish television crew filmed it with a fisheye lens for a documentary on the last meals of death row inmates. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Are you trying to tie the last meal on death row guys in with the Last Supper of Christ? He was skinny, scrawny, druggy when he did this to my mom. They said that was his main objective in jail was his feedings and getting his food and making sure all of his needs were met. He was absolutely a blimp by the time they executed him. It's been so many years since I had junk food out on the streets. So I'm going to order a, one of them big Pizza Hut pizzas with a cheese in the ring. I'm going to order about four big Burger King Whoppers and French fries and about three big two-liter Pepsis. Bucket of ice, a bottle of ketchup, some salt, and uh, I want a big plate of eggplants rolled in cornmeal and deep fried, and some squash rolled in cornmeal and deep fried, and some okra rolled in cornmeal and deep fried, and a big pecan pie. And I'm going to eat from, you can see, I can do that. I'm going to get my money's worth by that last meal. In the years following his killing spree, 
Pruitt had professed a belief in God. He had decided to forego his last set of appeals and let his death sentence proceed unimpeded. Buddy, I was a devil. I mean, I wasn't nothing nice. How could I honestly take a life and say you can't take mine? I got no beef whatsoever with mankind. Pruitt said he accepted his fate and was no longer angry. But I believe in my heart I should die for what I've done. I really do. But the last 17 years, the one thing it's done, it gave me a chance to receive the Lord and to get to study this Bible for 14 years. And I'm at peace now, man. Pruitt had maintained contact with some people on the outside including Alice Vick, a friend from New Mexico during the period when he was in the Witness Protection Program. She believes Pruitt had a true religious conversion in prison. He just got mixed up with drugs and it made him crazy. He did some horrible, horrible things, but like I told him, if the Lord could forgive him, I sure could. And I did. I know I'm forgiving him, you know. And, uh... That's going to be my last words. Marion Pruitt's execution went forward as planned on April 12, 1999, in Grady, Arkansas. All of our family went. Even though he wasn't being executed for my mother's death, we were grateful that that point in time that he was going to get just treatment for what it did to other people besides her. And just out of support for them, we wanted to be there. Pruitt was strapped to the lethal injection gurney. He begged God and the family members of his victims for forgiveness before the needle was inserted in his arm. Okay, it's official. They administered the lethal injection at 8.04. Pruitt expired at 8.09. Pruitt's execution closed the book on one of the Federal Witness Protection Program's worst embarrassments. His brutal crimes had brought unpleasant publicity to the program. It's operating on the premise that one criminal is going to testify against another criminal and tell the truth. Well, I think experience has shown, uh, as in the case of Pruitt, uh, that if you offer incentive to person, he'll testify to whatever he thinks you want to hear. Before his execution, Pruitt even told a reporter that his claim of having witnessed the murder of his cellmate in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary back in 1978 was false. That testimony had earned him his place in the witness protection program. He now insisted that he was the real murderer. Justice Department officials deny Pruitt's story, saying it was a lie spun to get attention. I think that was Pruitt again trying to strike out and just hurt, but this time he can't strike with a gun. The former director of the program for the Justice Department, Gerald Schur, says that Pruitt's killing spree was a sad but rare aberration. We had never had this happen before uh, in the, uh, with anyone who had been in the witness program. The witness program didn't go wrong in the Pruitt case. Pruitt went wrong in the Pruitt case. If I saw Pruitt again today, uh, yes, I would put him in the program in prison, and I suppose I would be inclined not to put him in the program when he left prison but how would I ever stop him from killing? He was determined to murder. After Pruitt murdered their son in 1981, Frank Balderson and his wife Betty started lobbying against the witness protection program. They testified before a congressional committee demanding that surveillance of protected criminals be improved. Three years later in 1984, Congress amended the program. It gave new directives to the Justice Department which raised the standards on who would be allowed into the program. These included mandatory psychological testing of prospective witnesses. Congress also provided compensation to victims up to $50,000 for their losses due to the crimes of protected witnesses. Frank Balderson and his family eventually collected $25,000. We had to make a claim for him. My wife wanted to go ahead and make the claim, make them pay through the nose, so to speak. Uh, and our friends and relatives encouraged us to do that, so I did. But there's no amount of money can compensate for the loss of our son. The Balderson family is still angry with the witness protection program. 
Even some in law enforcement wonder whether the Pruitt case was handled properly. I don't know. I had mixed feelings about it. How many crimes can a person commit before his true identity is uh, revealed to the public? This program was responsible for making this country significantly safer. Unfortunately, some of those people entering this program were still going to commit crime, still going to commit murder, and there was that one Pruitt that committed so many murders that sort of rocked us all back on our heels. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised.